Hope everyone's having a great weekend. This is our week in review. We'll look back at some of the most compelling segments of this past week. Brand new episodes back again Monday morning at 5 a.m. here in the podcast. This is the examination of the hidden human condition. You're listening to the Hidden Killers podcast. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. Brian Koberger case that continues to evolve and information continues to come out about. We're talking with Lara Uretzian about some of those more recent developments uh, on this pod. Laura, I want to just kind of jump right into this. Uh, very interesting, the stories about the IDs. And uh, there's two different instances where IDs have come up here in the police reports. Initially, it was mentioned once. It wasn't very specific about whose they were. Maybe it could have been his own. I don't know. Uh, But then in a more recent, the chicken scratch report, as we've been kind of referring to it, uh, it it talks about the ID of someone at the King Road house being in his possession at his own residence, not uh, just somewhere found at the crime scene, but literally within the possession of Brian Koberger. Uh, There's DNA, there's all sorts of triangulation data on cell phones, but the presence of a physical ID of possibly one of the victims, how damning is that? Uh, I think the obvious (laughs) is that if it's one of the, uh, the ID belongs to one of the deceased, one of the four uh, students, then it would be pretty damning. Yeah. Uh, Whether he got it from the home, he got it from their mailbox, he got it from somewhere. I almost don't care where he got it from. If it belongs to one of these four individuals, it is pretty damning, especially in the way that it was hidden within a glove. I mean, the idea that it was hidden uh, Mm -hmm. to me is also pretty damning too. So overall, it's not the best evidence. So even if it belongs to one of some one of the living mm-hmm. uh, individuals, uh, the survivors, that also is not very helpful to him. Why is it that he has their ID? How did he get his hands on their ID? Did he? I would have a lot of questions. Maybe it's not clearly. It's not going to be as damning as if, if it belonged to one of the deceased. Mm-hmm. But uh, it could also be problematic depending on how he got his hands on this ID. Uh, Maybe he knew one of them. Maybe he worked with one of them. Maybe he dated somebody. Maybe someone left it in his car. Maybe he Mm -hmm. found it on the floor. I don't know, but there's going to be a lot of questions that I'm going to want answers to before I can decide if that's really going to be super damning or not. Uh, And we'll see. It's an interesting twist. It it really is an interesting twist because they really don't have a lot as as far as placing him within the home itself. Mm -hmm other than the DNA, but even that you can explain that, you know, it got there uh, somehow, not necessarily because he was there, Mm -hmm. but because he may have touched it or transference or whatever it may be, right? Because if he really was there, and and the defense is going to make this argument, then you would have found his DNA not just on the sheet, Mm -hmm. but you found it all over the place, right? Well, would they already have that? Is that something that they may know and we do not know yet? Or would they be revealing that at this point? Uh, obviously, very little has been talked about. There's the gag order in place and such. Uh, what I'm wondering is, with all those things that they did bring out of that home, uh, and some of it does look like it was blood in some way, shape, or form, or some sort of fluid on things, uh, but they've not released the results of those tests yet, would they just still be holding onto that information for when it comes to court or when it comes to the hearing coming up in June? Well, I mean, if there's a gag order, obviously it's not going to be available to, yep. the, to the public, but it's going to be available to the parties involved. Mm-hmm. And if they've got the results, they would have to clearly share it with um, the defense. Are we going to know about it? Probably not now. We may find out once a hearing does take place and they start presenting their evidence. With individuals like this that are accused of a crime like this with murder, and we see sometimes people take uh, trophies or souvenirs or whatever you want to call it when somebody leaves a crime scene, and that's really kind of what this ID is looking like uh, if you were to to make a judgment from the outside. 
How difficult is that to to defend in court? Have you ever had one where maybe it, it even looked like it was a trophy of some sort, but it was just, you know, this is really weird on how this got into this person's possession, but really had nothing to do with them taking it after some sort of a crime? Listen, this idea of the trophy, and we know that this isn't the first time we've seen that, yeah. right? Um, and, and and you know that after all this time and all, all the interest in him, it was still within, let's say, his possession, whether it be constructive or actual possession, but it's, he had, you know, a way, a, it was accessible to him, right? Mm -hmm. It was at his parents' house. And you would have, you would think that they, he would have gotten rid of that by now, unless he just, what I'm thinking is, it could be trophy, and that would be very damning. And that's why I'm saying that would be damning evidence. Yeah, yeah. Not only would it place him there, but it would also have this, 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 um, you know, it would show that maybe he's a sociopath or someone who likes to keep yeah. something from one of the victims. If it, if it does belong to one of the four deceased. Yeah. Uh, or it could be that something that he got by chance. I don't know how it ended up by him. And he didn't even realize it's with him or... Uh, otherwise, you you would think that he would get rid of it, right? One would think. Um, but uh, again, I mean, sometimes you you have these people that hold on to it. I was talking to a psychologist the other day about this, and and her thought was it was you know probably something sexual. It was you know hold on to this. It's a piece of the crime. It's a piece of you know it's something from them, a very personal thing from one of them. And oftentimes, uh, killers uh, they will take something of that to remember the crime by, and then. Uh, use it for their own purposes uh, after the fact. I guess. I mean, I mean, and you would you were also going to have to think that did he have time to do that mm -hmm. when he was at the scene? I mean, with everything going on, did he have uh, that moment or the time to go look for an ID, or was it somewhere on a desk on a bed accessible and he quickly grabbed it? Mm -hmm. That would that that I could see, but you know, going into a wallet, getting it. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it's it, possible here. It's interesting to think about the process and, and how, how much was he thinking of that process or was it, uh, you know, kind of he's on the way out and there's this and he just grabs it and goes, uh, and grabs it. Yeah. that I could see that sure. I could see. But again, I mean, again, the only way I would explain it, especially if it belongs to one of the, uh, victims here is if he, he, this, the idea of this trophy, right. Something mm -hmm. to remember this, this, crime by, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's sexual or not, is just something for him to have. I mean, any, listen, anything is possible. <laughs> I would have loved to have more information, just like I'm sure you would, yeah. uh, especially the identity of the person whose idea it is that he had. I think that'll be very interesting when that finally does come out to know who, in fact, it is. Uh, would it, it may show us the motive, too. Exactly. One of them, it could show he may have had it prior to going into the house. Remember that too. And it could be the motive. He was fixated or obsessed with one of them. Mm -hmm. And the others happened to be there and got killed as well. I mean, you never know. I actually brought that exact point up the other day with someone. I said, what did, but did he get it at the crime scene or did he get this earlier on when he was stalking? Is this something where maybe he got a, you know, a hold of it at a bar or someplace where an ID may be left out or lost? I'd be curious to know if any of the victims had lost their ID prior to the murders actually taking place. What that tells us, I don't know, but it would be an interesting piece to the puzzle. And that's a great question, if one of them had lost no. his or her ID. When it, we're talking about the DNA here with this case, there has been obviously some talk about the knife sheath DNA. It was sent to the initial lab. They couldn't find much of anything on it, but then it was sent to another genealogical DNA lab in Texas, in which they were able to link the DNA on the knife sheath uh, to the Koberger family uh, through DNA to his father in um, in Pennsylvania, and then uh, narrowing it down that it was his son's DNA that was on there. Uh, the fact that this thing moved to, to two different labs, obviously, if it's in a chain of custody and it's well documented, it shouldn't really be much of an issue. But is this something that could still be raised as a concern uh, in the defense of Koberger, once this or if this does go to trial, with there being those uh, two issues with the DNA, one not finding enough, and then the other uh, being able to dig a little bit deeper, uh, there may be, and and I'm sure the defense is going to have an expert to address that. I don't think there's going to be chain of custody issue, but but again, you never know; it could happen. Sure. But it's more likely this discrepancy or the different results. Why is it that one connects it? 
to his family, to Kohlberger's family, and the other does not. Um, it could be that one is a more in-depth analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen that sometimes they'll they'll do an initial or preliminary testing and uh, and it, maybe the preliminary wasn't enough, but even that should have come back as positive. So something is off here. I'm not sure what it is. And I'm sure the defense is going to have a field day with it. I can tell you that. And we're, you're going to see a DNA expert testifying in this case, especially maybe they could even show that. Uh, I'm sure the defense at this point is even having it tested mm-hmm. uh, through their own uh, lab or someone that they know, their expert. They're going to raise it. Let's see what they come up with. It's going to be interesting as more twists and turns continue to come in here on the Koberger case with the ID evidence that we heard about uh, with this DNA information. Uh, Where are you leaning uh, on where this is going to end up going in June? Obviously, he has not pled yet. Uh, At at some point, uh, if you were the the defense attorney for Koberger, is there a point where you say, look, just let's make a plea. Let's, you know, do something here because you're not going to make it in court with this much against you. Uh, obviously the, his lawyers are in a better position to make that decision because they know what the evidence is that they've got a better picture of the evidence than we do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, imagine if this ID comes back as an ID belonging to one of the uh, deceased, Mm -hmm. especially if it's one of the females. And if we, for example, find out that maybe he, um, either picked it up from the home or at an earlier, on an earlier date, like you said, maybe from a bar, there's some kind of fixation. If there's more DNA evidence, not just the one on the sheet. I mean, yep. that it's, it, it makes no sense for it to have been just one item. I mean, if he truly is committing this crime um, and if his DNA is on one item, then there should be more. That means maybe he's not wearing the gloves uh, at least at a certain point. So if there's more DNA, okay, mm-hmm. evidence against them, more forensic evidence, then it's going to get to a point where you say, you know what, I can uh, DNA on the sheath, maybe we can explain, right? Yeah. Um, an idea of one of the others, somehow, I don't know, maybe he knew somebody you can explain. But if you start getting lots of DNA, I think that's when you, you say, you know what, this is it. Mm-hmm. We're done. Your DNA is all over the place, not in just one room. It's in every single one of those rooms. You have no relationship with any of these people. Your DNA should not have been in there. Boom. Mm-hmm. That's it. I think that's where I would say it's time for us to sit down and figure out what we can get for you. What do you do in that situation? I'm just curious, professionally, if you had to have that conversation and they still say, nope, was it me? Do you have the option at that point as an attorney to say, uh, well, that's cool, but I'm not going to be defending you anymore. I'm going to withdraw myself from this case. Or are you still, are you, do you still have to be there until he finds other counsel? There is nothing that says you have to stay or leave. That's a personal choice. The lawyer makes Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's something that the court's involved in because you have to be relieved by the judge. Okay. Um, most of the time it's not an issue. If, if, a lawyer is not comfortable representing that defendant anymore because, for example, the defendant is insistent that they didn't do it, but the lawyer, based on the evidence and based on all the work and the due diligence that he or she has done, doesn't believe that this defendant is as innocent as he proclaims to be, right? That, That may, and if the lawyer feels that that raises a conflict, he can't really defend this individual, then maybe that lawyer should be withdrawing he should he or she should be withdrawing and um you know the, the, the judges i mean the lawyer can never go up to the judge and say i believe my client is <laughs> sure can you relieve me yeah it, it could be a mutual decision between counsel and uh uh the defendant that this lawyer wants to be relieved and the defendant is agreeable and then a new new counsel comes in mm-hmm. but you can't just just walk out. You can't just leave your client. Have you ever wanted the- to though? Have you just been like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there are ways yeah. of defending your clients, even if you believe that they are guilty. I mean, sure. you can still put on a case. You just, you defend them as best you can, mm-hmm. especially if your client's adamant, he didn't do it. You, yep. You've got an obligation to defend that client. 
you can't just turn your back on them and walk out because you believe something. You sure. can believe all sorts of st- things and you may you may be right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Especially when your client's adamant that they didn't do it, that they're innocent. You you move forward, you do the best you can. You're an advocate for that client. Now, if the client tells you something, they tell you I did it, and then they want to take the stand mm-hmm. and they want to lie about it. That's a problem that you cannot <laughs> do. Okay, you can't do. And in fact, I mean, there's ethical rules about that. That the client, if the client insists that that they're going to take the stand in their own defense and they're going to lie, you just put them on. You don't even ask questions. You can't prevent them from testifying. Mm-hmm. You don't ask questions. You just, it's an open ended. Go ahead, sir. You can testify. Boom. Mm-hmm. You're not asking questions. You're not getting information. And uh, and you, it, what are you going to do as an attorney? Sure. Um, I mean, it's it's a tough call. But listen, I've represented people that it, it, I've thought maybe maybe he did it, but the client's been adamant, and I've I've defended them. You've got to defend them. Sure. Sure. You're doing your job. That's that's what you're supposed that's to. That's my be. job. Exactly. I'm not here to judge. Mm-hmm. My job is to be an advocate. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Lara Uretzian, criminal defense attorney, one of the best out there. Thank you so much for your insight as always. Love having you on. If you like the show, be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any breaking updates and discussions of the cases we are following for you right here. You can get an ad-free version through Apple Podcasts right now. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us.